Welcome to Living a Graceful Life. I'm your host, Denise Medved, and I'm also the creator and founder of the Ageless Grace Brain Health Program, which is helping people have sharper, healthier brains, not only in 50 U.S. states, but in 32 other countries around the world. So the purpose of this show, our true mission, is to remind every one of you watching that it's never too late to begin to make choices to create the life that you want to live. And that's the perfect segue right into our guest for this episode. Catherine Dreyer is uh, many things, and I'm going to tell you more about her, but she is going to talk on how to love yourself. And I love the next phrase and make your inner critic your greatest ally. So Catherine, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you, Denise. It's so fun to be here with you. Just always, love. always fun to be with you. Catherine, I've actually known each other a long time in a previous life in New York City and Connecticut. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, and we've stayed in touch on and off over the years. And I want to tell you a little bit about her because it's pretty impressive, first of all, uh, and will help you understand why she's chosen this topic. She's co-founder and co-author of Chi Running, Chi Walking, Chi Living, and Chi Life coaching books and programs. She spent 15 years in the natural health world, and she was president of New Hope Communications and vice president of healthshop.com. She focuses now on her greatest love, which is chi life coaching and helping women to love themselves and to love their lives. And I will tell you later on how you can get in touch with Catherine toward the end of our content of our show um, so that you can communicate with her. Uh, but thank you so much again for coming on, Catherine. And I love your topic. Yeah, it's an important one, I will say. And and I don't think that we really get schooled in it very well. You know, we don't really learn that much about how to really not just take care of ourselves, because that's sort of, you know, the thing today is to take really good care of yourself. But there's something even deeper that can happen and that is truly loving yourself. And, you know, it really can change your life. It can lead to that more graceful life that you're, you're such a great advocate for and amazing. Well, so yes, loving I think really a lot of people struggle with that loving yourself. Uh, you know, our society, certainly in the era that most of us watching this grew up, uh, was an era of put others first, have a life of service, uh, you know, be a really good whatever, mother, wife, uh, businesswoman, uh, put your business out there. All these things kind of got in the way for, for many people, including myself at different times, of, of really taking care of myself. But even, as you said, on a deeper level, loving myself yeah. uh, instead of being so critical. So one of the things I want to ask you is, um, is how does loving yourself make a difference? Won't life go on the same whether we love ourselves or not? <laughs> well, actually, it doesn't go on the same if you love yourself or not. There is quite a difference about what happens when you learn to really and practice rather than it's really a practice. It really is a practice. And so when you have this practice of loving yourself, what happens is all those other activities that you were talking about, being mother, being spouse, being business person, being in society, doing help for others and service for others. When you fully love yourself, then all of the love and that energy is an overflow. It's an overflow into the world. It's an overflow. So your business, your parenting, your support of others doesn't come from a place of lack and forcing yourself to do it. So it, it, it's a completely different angle on 
Um, so, and it changes everything. So that's one aspect of it is that when you really deeply and fully, and we're going to talk about how, like how to, it's such a funny, weird thing, how to love yourself. I'm going to get to that. But when you do, and you have this vibrant energy coming forth, then none of those things are, are the drain that they are when you're only doing it. If you think you're supposed to, if you're supposed to be a certain way. So that's one of the differences that happens. And then the other one is, is when the world is a mirror, right? It really is a, a reflection of what's going on internally. So when we are loving ourselves, then when we look out at the world, we look out at the world with love and with the expectation of love and with the openness to the life around us. But when we're hard on ourselves and really challenging ourselves and critical, we're going to talk about that inner critic. When we're really critical of ourselves, when we look out at the world and we become critical of it. So, and when we're critical of the world, it's all a lens, right? It's like the, it's like the rose colored glasses or the dark glasses. It's, it's how you see the world and how you see the world really has a big effect on how, on what's going on in the world. And so, yes, when you love yourself, then the energy of love is both within and without. So it's really, there are a lot of ways that loving yourself, you know, has a big impact on your day-to-day -day life. And, um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the how, what do you think? Yes, I think that's <laughs> great. So I do, um, I have been doing this practice, these practices for many, many years. And one of the practices that to me is really important is a deep listening to oneself. So, so we go through life and with this we're looking out all the time, right? We have so much we have to do. So there's a lot of looking out into the world. But what we end up not doing is really taking the time to hear, feel, and tend to what's inside of us. And when we do tend to what's inside of us, it feels loved. <laughs> so so by, you know, when we're doing so much, we're doing our businesses, we're taking care of kids, we don't really get to stop as much and really feel what's going on for us. And those parts um, become upset. They get, and then they start getting louder and they start getting more intense. And one of the partial selves is the language that's often used. Um, so we have our whole self and we also have partial selves, right? So partial yeah. self, an example of a partial self might be if you're trying not to eat sweets. So you'll have one part that's saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Sugar is bad for me. I'm not going to have that afternoon sweet treat. And you're going to have another part, a partial self that says, oh, come on, you deserve it. You've been working hard all day. You've been doing so much for everybody else. This is just a treat just for you, right? So those are two partial selves. And then there is your whole self, the whole of you, and that whole self can hear both of them, right? It's sort of the monitor of those two voices. And it's listening to both of them and it's going back and forth. So sometimes there's a partial self that's the inner critic. And the inner critic can get really, really vocal when it doesn't feel heard and when it doesn't feel paid attention to. So the inner critic can really start taking over and it can really get loud. And I, I, I as a, when we talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit more about how to be with that inner critic. But before that, I want to say that 
what we want as children, what we want when we're growing up from our parents. And I'm just gonna limit it to two things, but there are two really important things that make us feel loved as children. And one of them is to be seen and heard and felt, you know, just, just to be looked into in your eyes. Like as a little kid, there's this craving to have somebody look you directly in the eyes and really listen to you. And the second thing that that child wants is not just to be seen and heard, but to be accepted exactly the way he or she is an acceptance, like not just a listening, but then not a, a coming back of, oh, but you should change this or you should do that or whatever. So that's true for all of ourselves, all of us, what, what, what we want internally and the way to love ourselves is to give ourselves those two things to be seen, heard, and felt. It sounds like that's like one thing, but you know, just really that presence. And then the second thing is accepting that, accepting, you know, if, however that child is and however this partial self may be within us. So I spend a lot of time with my clients and my friends and my husband, and I do this listening practice where we listen to the parts really deeply. We really take our time to listen to what's going on internally. And then what we're offering is total acceptance, not trying to change not trying to improve, not trying to perfect. So I think that's where one of the main things that goes on in society today is that we're being told that we need to improve ourselves all the time, that we're needing to change ourselves to be acceptable, that we can't be just who and how we are. Wow, that's powerful. Needless to say, and I'm sure everyone listening is feeling this, because um, it's I, I can speak only for myself. But when there are parts of me uh, that say certain things that that I don't see fitting into the best role uh, of what the world wants from me I'll say oh I don't want to listen to that part of me I don't want to hear what that part has to say oh that if that part wins it's going to make me look weak or that part's going to make me um, feel like I'm uh, not not good enough or whatever and uh, so I I raised my eyebrows uh, in wonder when you said to just accept that part. It's part of me or it wouldn't be speaking, right? <laughs> yeah. So Carl Jung talked about it as the shadow self. You know, it's the parts of ourselves that feel sort of dark or feel, you know, I had a bout the other day. I went for a walk with a girlfriend who I just love and she was telling me all these wonderful things in her life. I was so happy for her. And then I walked home because it was really close to where I live. And I felt jealousy. Wow. And I was so sort of shocked. I really was, but it was plain out jealousy. And, and um, at my first reaction was, Catherine, how could you feel, you're happy for Mary. What's, why would you be that way? So it immediately tried to stop this feeling from coming up. But my practice is, tells, tells me something very different. So I told that part just to calm down and hush a little bit. And I really wanted to listen to what the jealous part had to say, because I also knew it was a clue to something that might be really important to me living a graceful life, to something I might want that I'm not even aware of that I wanted. And so I realized I really want to listen to this part. I want to listen and hear what it has to say. 
And really, and I did, and it was only, I just did it for like a 10 minute walk. And so for those 10 minutes during my walk, I was able to just pay attention. And I found that it was just about sort of wanting to be more energetic, wanting to get out and do a few different things. Like I had been doing a lot of stuff in the house and it really didn't turn out to be a big deal, but it turned out to be important to me and my happiness. So we do this all the time. You know, um, we are repressing all of these natural feelings that come up and we're labeling them as bad. But the truth is, and the one that we do it the most to <laughs> is the inner critic. So the inner critic will come in. The inner critic will come in and say, you didn't do your morning well. You slept in late. You didn't do your morning well. And now your whole day is going to be terrible or whatever. You know, when you don't have a yeah. good start to your morning and you maybe, you know, things don't go with the way you planned. And then this voice starts coming in saying, you didn't do a good job. You should have done a better job, right? So that inner critic is one that we most of the time are saying, I do not want to listen to that. As a matter of fact, we've done that so much. We have so much and so often told the inner critic to go away that we don't even really hear it anymore. We just sort of feel it in our bodies because it is speaking to us but we don't necessarily clearly hear its voice because we've really told it not to show up. I went to a course once, it was at the Esalen Institute in New York. And I, um, it was all about, it was about the inner critic, but I went in and they said, do everything to keep it at bay, do everything possible to avoid it. Do not look at it, do not talk to it. I mean, I was just, I was in such a different mode in my life. I was really learning to listen to it. And I knew how dangerous that was. I knew how dangerous it was. I have a quote that I want to read. It's from the Gospel of Thomas. Um, so not all the Gospels made it into the Bible, but there were other Gospels, right? You've, you know right. about, even Absolutely. there's one from Mary Magdalene. Um a real gospel from her, but there's also a gospel from Thomas. And it's just a bunch of quotes, really, like it's, it's available, they found it, and it's now available as a book. But this was from the gospel of Thomas. So Jesus said, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, that which you do not bring forth will destroy you. Wow. 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 Yeah. And incredible. It is so powerful. I really love, I, I live by that quote, to be honest, because I so much feel like what we repress is working underneath and it's not allowing us to fully live life fully or fully love ourselves. But when you listen to these parts, when you spend just a little extra time becoming aware of them and allowing their presence, you're actually bringing love to them. It's a kind of a love. It's seeing them, feeling them, hearing them, and then it's accepting them. And it really is a feeling of love. That is, that is a how to of loving. And so, and so right? simple, not complicated, very simple. Well, how, how do you have advice on how to incorporate this time into your day? To, yeah. We all think we're busy, whether we are or not. We all believe we're busy and that we have too much to do. So how do we incorporate this listening to ourselves, listening to our inner critic and seeing it and hearing it and also accepting when it says, how do, how do we find time for that? 
I'm going to tell you that. And then I'm going to tell you the result of when you listen to inner critic, because, Ooh, that is the best part. <laughs> it really is. It's really profound. So, um, so you, you, you're taking the time regularly throughout the day. It's not additional time. It's doing whatever you do. So I am doing it, like I say, when I take a walk, of course, yoga is all about, right? What yoga is all about physically doing these movements and listening to yourself in the midst of it, right? It's really the truth of yoga. Yoga isn't just about the physical part. The real, real gem in yoga is to be listening to the response your body is having as you do these, as you do that. So it's almost like yoga all day long, but you're not necessarily doing downward dog. You're, you're, you're cooking dinner. You're driving the car someplace. I do so much in the car. I listen to myself really deeply just driving in the car. You can still drive perfectly, you know, probably even better than listening to the radio. So it is a matter of turning off a lot of the input, right? We have so much input. We watch TV, we listen to podcasts, although I welcome people. I mean, listening to podcasts is important to me too, because I learned so much, but I'm just saying there's so much input, right? We're just we're constantly taking in. And so when I do laundry, when I hang the laundry. When I clean the kitchen, that is a really good time. I can just stop and say, okay, how am I feeling? Oh, I'm feeling tired or, and you're feeling it in your body. It's real body, body experience as is the inner critic. So the inner critic is any time you feel your energy drop, you feel a little bit, uh, a little bit not so great about yourself just for even any, or sometimes there's a lot of that, right? For There's a lot of that sometimes. Um, you can turn to it and there's a phrase, whenever you feel that little bit of negativity, you can turn to it and you can say, might you be worried? And that comes from Ann Weiser Cornell and Jean Genlin's focusing. And this is how I, one of the ways I learned to deal and be with the inner critic. And that phrase itself is just, a, it's not a direct question. It's just a real compassionate, might you be worried? And the reason why it's worried is because the inner critic is really your greatest ally. And it truly is. It's always wanting the best for you. It's just that it doesn't know how to do it any other way. And partly because we haven't listened to it. That so, so what, much sense. oh yeah. So when you start listening to it and now I will say, I do take extra time sometimes like now and then I will take a, like a long session, an hour or something and really be with the inner critic. Now the inner critic is always worried. It's always trying to protect you. And so listening to it, I will say, I mean, it's not like a one and done and it's not just absolutely easy because the inner critic is protecting you from your and its greatest fears, most of which are not true, <laughs> right? Wasn't it Mark Twain who said, I've had all these fears, none of which ever happened or were real. I mean, we have all these fears and most of them aren't true. And the inner critic is the house of all these fears. And when you listen to its fears, when you say, might you be worried, it will give you a raft of things it's worried about. But when you listen to them all, it turns and it tells you what it really wants for you. And it is magic. It is the most deep and profound in sessions with clients and for myself and for our friends and family. My husband, he's really, he loves doing this because he has felt this turn where suddenly the inner critic is actually the one telling you you're sort of 
your greatest potential. It is, it is the doorway to your greatest potential. And that is what it wants for you. <laughs> it's really, and I say this from experience. I have just sat with, I, I consider the inner critic sort of my specialty. <laughs> and um, I have just sat with so many people listening to their inner critic, listening to all of its fears. And there, it can be scary. Like, you know, facing our fears is a big deal. Yeah. It's not, it's not simple, but if you can just get a little bit of fortitude and get this notion that it's not real, you know, the inner critic, another thing about it, it's actually a very young part. And I have a good analogy. It's close to Halloween. When I was a little girl, I had a witch's costume. I was five. I remember it so clearly. <laughs> and I put on my little witch's costume and I came downstairs and my uh, two-year-old little brother started crying. And I was so happy because that meant I was really scary. <laughs> The inner critic is just like that. It is just a mask. It's really just a little child with a costume on trying to scare you because it's trying to get your attention. I love that analogy. That's that's a, a, a beautiful analogy. I uh, confess to our audience that I have done a bit of this, this focusing work with Catherine before, and it's powerful. It's amazing how it can take, first of all, for me, it pinpointed little things that were actually big that I didn't even know I was concerned about. And I certainly didn't know that my inner critic was, was concerned about them. And then when I was able to see those things in the light of my inner critic being worried about me you know, not listening to that, not following through on that, not uh, doing it well, whatever it might be. It was fascinating how it turned it around and yeah. made me say like, wow, I, I didn't even know that that was anywhere in my awareness. And, and here it was actually a big thing um, that I needed to pay attention to, but it hadn't been called to my awareness until I did this exercise. So I and I, it's been a long time since we did that. And I've been feeling it in my body, as you were saying, might you be worried? I went, oh, yes. I remember that phrase. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it really, it's so profound. And it's not the only part to listen to and be with. Right. But for me, it's made the biggest difference in my life. Absolutely. Because I had a very critical mother. And you know, I just embodied that for so long. I believed it. I believed the inner critic. I believed a lot of things that were pretty negative and um, changing that has changed my entire life. Oh, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. And, and I think all of us have probably had someone very critical in our lives, whether it was a mother, a father, both a sibling, a school teacher. And it's interesting how those things can stay with us. You know, if you look at the whole perspective of life, the thousands or tens of thousands of people you know and have met, all the praise you've gotten, all the support you've gotten. And then there's this one little time and you remember, oh, they told me I couldn't sing, that my voice was terrible. And then it became this guiding factor uh, throughout your life and and you believed it right you believe yeah it. and it takes on the voice of that your inner critic will is really a good mimicker and it will mimic your mother or your father or your teacher or whoever it was who told said those negative things about you that voice will take on that tone and that way of being which makes us even a little bit more afraid of it Wow, that makes sense. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Well, I, I could talk to you all evening, but believe it or not, our time is up. No. And I Thank want you. to, I know it just flew by, didn't it? But I want to tell people um, how to reach Catherine. And if you would give them a, a Gmail address 
where they can reach you. That would be wonderful because you have such wisdom uh, to share and impart. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was in the, our business was Chi Living, C-H-I. And so we wrote the Chi Running, Chi Walking books. But then my real love is Chi Life Coaching. So that's C H I Life Coach at gmail.com. That's the best way to reach me right now because we're cleaning up the website. So just to just a um an email to my Gmail account, Chi Life Coach at gmail.com is the best way to get a hold of me right now. Fabulous. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that that you might be amazed at how her techniques and her wisdom and insight can make a huge difference in exactly what this show is about. What we're here to remind you is that it's never too late to begin to make choices to create the life that you want to live. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Denise. You embody everything that... <laughs> I'm working towards, and I'm so grateful to have you as a wonderful friend. Thank you too, Catherine, so much. And thank everyone for yeah, watching and thank sharing. Thank you all with for us. joining. <laughs>